in the last occasion, we are talking about the way commerce actually acted as the main dynamic in British expansion. And the first uh, region which came to be affected by the desire for the company to extract as much commercial advantage as possible or to create a territorial foothold was Bengal. So not unnaturally, Bengal was described as the British Bridget by one of the distinguished historians uh, in recent times. So it's important for us to look a little more closely at the way between, say, 1757 and 1765, the nominal uh, independence of Bengal that Murshid Kuli Khan as the subadar of Bengal had created earlier in the 18th century was destroyed. Uh, the formal domination of the company as a part of the Mughal government was created, was established in 1765, and within six, seven years, virtually Bengal became uh, the nucleus of the emerging British Empire in India with a huge army, with huge resources, enabling the British to move westwards towards North India and finally to Delhi. Historians have talked about the different stages of imperialism from different perspectives. As a one can actually look at the way over time commercial interest became less important than the desire by the, comp by the British to sell their industrial products to India or to create possibilities of profitable investment of their money in Indian uh, infrastructure, in railways, in plantation. So that is one way of looking at it. The other way, of course, is to look at the gradual territorial expansion, military expansion, how the bridgehead eventually enabled the British to cross other territories, to cross other boundaries, to create, finally, this large empire at the subcontinent. Murshid Kuli Khan had been able to create a fairly stable political base of a regional dynasty. So it is important to ask this question of why ultimately a stable region, a prosperous region, a dynasty which has been able to keep order, which has been able to strike its roots in the region deeply, how is it that this region became the first target of the British and eventually passed into their control? So some scholars talk about a conspiracy, a conspiracy that was going on in uh, Bengal, even from Alibar this time, and the conspiracy began to bear fruits during the time when Siraj Udala, a haughty young man, became the Nawab. The origin of this particular theory goes back to a British scholar writing in the early part of the 20th century, whose name is S.C. Hill. Now, this man tried to argue that in the province of Bengal, there was a seismic rift, there was a schism between the Hindus and the Muslims. The Hindus became alienated by Siraj's uh, misdemeanor, Siraj's various activities. And the Hindu bankers and traders, men like Jagat Sheth, had been leading a certain faction to unseat Siraj and to replace him with a more pliable person. Now, this particular thesis is no longer acceptable on the ground that if there was a rift or if there was a conspiracy at all, then in this conspiracy, both Hindus and Muslims together plotted against the Nawab. And also both Hindus and Muslims together fought on the Nawab side. So the question of a Hindu conspiracy dividing the uh, region or dividing the polity or creating dissidences in the state or in the province is not a very valid theory. But uh, there was a certain intrigue. There was an atmosphere of intrigue. And this atmosphere actually was visible even before Siraj Udola became the Nawab. Because the family itself, uh, from which Aliverdi came, was involved in frequent intrigues against one another. Think of Aliverdi's usurpation. Aliverdi was became Nawab by usurping the throne, by deposing Sarfaraz Khan, who was the son-in-law of Murshid Kule Khan. Now, it is true that Jagat Sheth, who was a very close associate of Aliverdi, who supported Aliverdi's candidature or continued to support him 
ultimately managed the uh, through his influence in the court of delhi managed to acquire legitimacy for ali burde khan so that is there so it is not as if that the hindus were so hostile to the nawab that they were deliberately participating in this conspiracy but one should always remember that in the 18th century context there were competing court factions some of these factions would always like to see one of their nominees as nawab by excluding someone who is not so pliable so mr zafar who was the nominee nominee of the court clique also became uh, the nominee of the british for other considerations for mr zafar actually agreed to give him uh, give the british certain amount of compensations and rewards so even though conspiracy theory in the way it was cast early in the 20th century is not acceptable and historians in search of long term causes would not would not give much emphasis on the argument about conspiracy but it is a fact that in the mid 18th century bengal when sirajuddolla became the nawab some of his actions some of his haughty behavior had alienated certain powerful sections of the local society including trading classes including bankers like jagat shet who had always been very supportive to the local dynasty including very powerful groups of courtiers in uh, led by men like mir zafar mir zafar was a part of that family so uh, this is uh, a very contentious argument but one cannot simply dispense with it altogether now there is a very interesting work a very important work by a man like brijan gupta the title of the book is sirajuddolla and the east india company in which brijan gupta try to argue that despite the appearance of stability the regime in murshidabad had certain fundamental weaknesses these weaknesses according to brijan gupta arose from the way murshid kuli was alienating hindu landowners by forcing them to pay more than they could or by summoning them to the murshidabad court imprisoning them in order to extract more from them now brijan gupta otherwise is correct in emphasizing the way siraj actually had to go on war path against the company for a number of reasons but to say that the crisis of the bengal polity had begun at the time when this new dynasty had just emerged is to overemphasize this aspect of alienation between murshid kuli and some of his landlords or some of his support some of his zamindars we know from other sources from other historians that until aliver this time the political system in bengal was fairly stable so there was something to do with siraj's personality there was something to do with the way the young man was not able to uh, retain its control over the body politic in the way his grandfather did Aliverdin knew that the British were actually showing defiance against them. The Aliverdin knew that the British were plotting with some people from within the Murshidabad court, from within the Murshidabad family, a polity. But still, Aliverdin was capable of holding them uh, uh, in check, something which Siraj failed. So Aliverdin was always very careful about uh, imposing these restrictions on them, even though. when some of his advisers some of his courtiers had advised aliver the khan to throw the british out of bengal by using the french against them aliver they refrained from doing that aliver they didn't wish to become dependent on either of the two contending european companies but siraj was very decisive about taking on the company because siraj became came to realize that the company was not paying him the required obeisance that all of these oriental rulers or indian rulers or old rulers for that matter would actually demand from their subjects or from their inhabitants even though the company was not a subject of the nawab the company was inhabiting the realm in which he was the sovereign so against this backdrop if you look at the whole issue of fortification which was one of the major issues in uh, hastening this kind of conflict between siraj and the company fortification was um, in a way justified by the british on the ground that the nawab was incapable of protecting them from a possible french assault so so why is it that uh, the nawab of bengal sirajuddolla became angry about the manner in which the company was fortifying fortification was not merely 
strengthening the Fort William with new ammunition or new arms or with new contingents of forces, fortification was a was a symbol, was a symbolic defiance against the Nawab's authority in his own country, in his own land. So this is one reason why Siraj was very angry with the way this fortification business was going on. In addition, Siraj was receiving uh, frequent complaints from local merchants that the British were misusing the privileges, the privileges of uh, duty-free trade. Khoja Waze, that's an Armenian merchant, was close to the Nawab family, uh, complained regularly about such nefarious designs by the British officials uh, in their private trade. And lastly, uh, taking advantage of their stronger position in Calcutta, the way Fort William in Calcutta was fortified, and the British felt that they were becoming stronger than the French, and the British found that they had, uh, they had the ability to defy the Nawab's authority, they were also actually giving asylum to the fugitives, fugitives who were escaping the Nawab's justice. So you do not look at the question of fortification merely as an attempt by the company to strengthen the fort in order to protect themselves from French invasion or French assaults, but it became linked with a systematic attempt by the East India Company to defy the authority of a Nawab at a very critical juncture when they realized that Aliwardi was not there, the more seasoned person was not there, the young man was going to do mistakes, and the mistakes the company and their friends will take advantage of the mistakes to unseat them. So if you look at these issues, it's a question of private trade, question of fortification, the way Siraj felt insulted by this practice of extending asylum to fugitives who were escaping the law of justice, then you can explain why this conflict became inevitable. And it began with the sack of Calcutta in June 1756. Incensed by this attitudes of defiance, Siraj came down to Calcutta, took Fort William for a while, forced the British inhabitants to flee to a safer distance at Falta, a few miles downstream from Calcutta. But then Siraj did not consolidate its gains. He renamed the city as Alinagar and left for Murshidabad. And he went back to Murshidabad on the, in order to prepare for his defense against a possible invasion of Abdali on the borders of Bihar, which was a part of the Bengal Suba. But then Abdali's invasion never happened. And the company got the time to work out their plots. And this is where the conspiracy becomes relevant. The company began to link up with disgruntled courtiers. The company began to link up with uh, traders and bankers like Jagat Shed who had become unhappy with the doings of some of the doings of, the, of Siraj Udullah. And uh, they got the man, Mr. Zafar Ali. Zafar was willing to pay compensations to the company. Zafar willing, was willing to act in accordance with the men who wished to place him on the throne by excluding Siraj Udullah. And the conspiracy began to bear fruit ultimately in the Battle of Plassey. It was not a battle at all. Nobody gave the battle except Mir Madan and Mohan Lal. But their heroic struggle actually had no results because a huge contingent of the Nawab's army stood still under the command of Mirzafar and Rai Durlav. And the result was that a very uh, Plassey remained a skirmish. As far as military engagements were concerned, it had no significance. It remained a skirmish, but politically extremely important. But I would still argue that if Plassey was a skirmish and it ultimately removed Siraj Udullah, who had to die a very tragic death, at the instance of Mirjafar, his son was actually intrigued and his son was responsible for his murder. But then Baksar, which the battle, the second battle in 1764, was I consider, uh, would I, I would consider this to be a more decisive battle. Because still the Bengal Nawabs, despite the fact that the, no, the nominees, the men like Mirjafar and Mirkashim, were all appointed by the company, or nominated by the company, or at least nominated with the approval of the company, still they got the opportunity, or they had the opportunity. They occasionally showed signs of discomfort with the kind of uh, um, informal overlordship that the company was exercising over Bengal. 
So why was it that Mir Qasim decided to move against the company in spite of the fact that he accepted the informal overlordship of the company? He accepted it. I mean, there was no option. Mir Jafar was uh, put on the throne after Siraj's removal and he was known as the jackass of Lord Clive. He would do whatever Clive would ask him to do. And Clive, as you know, came to the company's rescue from South India uh, with a force from Madras. During that intervening period between the sack of Calcutta and the Battle of Plassey, and Clive participated regularly, very closely in the negotiations during this intervening period and agreed to Mir Jafar's uh, candidature or Mir Jafar's nomination on conditions that Mir Jafar would give to the company access to revenue rights in certain regions. Mir Jafar would actually ensure appointments of the friends of the company in crucial administrative positions. So Clive was insistent on protecting the power and privileges of their friends at Murshidabad and Mr. Jafar accepted it. But then after a while he began to feel that he was a ruler without the rod to rule. So he became somewhat uneasy, he began to plot with others, he began to uh, send overcharge to other Europeans in order to achieve a little bit of independence which the company was not in a mood to give. So, Mizafar was removed and his son-in-law, Mir Qasim, was installed again with the same kind of conditions. Mir Qasim, as you know, soon realized that South Bengal was out of the Nawab's uh, purview, or out of Nawab's real authority because you have the three revenue districts uh, were ceded to the company. The company got permanent revenue rights through an agreement with Mir Qasim. It was one of the conditions for which the company gave their support to Mir Qasim. So Mir Qasim's idea was that if South Bengal had completely been taken over by the company because of their commercial networks in that region, because of their control over the channel, Hooghly Channel, because of their location in Calcutta, then it was better for the Nawab of Bengal to consolidate on the north and on Bihar. So he was in a mood to withdraw from South Bengal and consolidate its hold in North Bengal in order to create a genuine political uh, base or in order to create, in order to rule uh, uh, as, a, as a real ruler. I mean, as far as these uh, districts were concerned where the revenue rights were ceded to the company, Mir Qasim's authority hardly existed. It was the company's authority. So, Mir Qasim, uh, in order to prepare for a kind of a genuine authority that he wished to exercise over a more closely knit region of Northern Bengal, began to re reorganize his government, began to um, um, uh, fill important positions with people loyal to him, remove people who were favorites of the company. Jagat Shet actually for some time lost all influence with Mir Qasim's government, Mir Qasim moved from Murshidabad to Munger. He began to increase uh, the size of the army, in, uh, increase the size of ammunition, uh, cannons uh, and, and uh, guns were procured. And eventually, in association with Sujaudullah, the Nawab Wazir of Awadh, he was the Nawab of Awadh, but at the same time he was appointed Wazir by the fugitive emperor Shah Alam and Shah Alam. These were the two allies ultimately Mir Qasim found in order to confront the company as which has been described by historians as the last stand of Mughal resistance in eastern India. And that was to happen at Baksar in 1764 in which Mir Qasim eventually lost. The three armies lost. I mean this combination, this Mughal combination that you find in Baksar, the Shah Alam on the one hand, uh, Nawab Wazir, which is Shujaudullah of Awadh, and Mir Qasim, the Nawab of Bengal, together tried to confront the company, but they didn't succeed. The Battle of Baksar was followed by this Treaty of Allahabad in 1765, in which Mughal Emperor was a signatory to an agreement that would give the East India Company the Diwani of Bengal. So that is the reason why I consider Baksar to be a more 
decisive event, a more important turning point in the history of British ascendancy in Eastern India. From then on, there was no turning around. But sir, uh, between the Battle of Plassey and Baksar, why is Baksar considered a more decisive event? That I was trying to explain to you. I mean, the Baksar would, uh, the defeat in Baksar would give the company the right to Diwani. So the company would be accepted as the Diwan of Bengal. And he was, it was accepted by no less than a person as the, uh, than a person, the Mughal Emperor, Shah Alam. Shah Alam makes the company Diwan, his Diwan of Bengal. And the company, it is argued, became a part of the Mughal revenue system, became a part of the Mughal order. Some of these uh, British uh, soldiers or British warriors, the commanders were given Mughal titles as well. Clive, for example, was known as the victor of war, Sabat Jung. Another person would be given the title of Delwar Jung. So they had this habit of acquiring Indian titles from the Mughal aristocracy in order to become a part of the Mughal political order, which the company very successfully did. Once they negotiated this treaty with Shah Alam at Allahabad and managed to acquire the right to Diwani. But the right to Diwani was significant for other reasons as well. It not merely by giving the company a space in the political system, the Diwani gave the company access to resources which the company started using for purposes of investment. I was talking about this on the, an earlier occasion of how territorial revenue became an important foundation. And the Diwani is a case in point where not merely the three districts, but the entire province of Bengal, including the regions in Bihar and Odisha, which were part of the Bengal Soba, the entire revenue of this province became uh, a monopoly of the British. If you look at the changes in the administration of Bengal between 1765 and 1772, you can see a new order emerging. Not in the very early stage, because in the early stage they would engage Muhammad Reza Khan as their naib. He was known as the deputy Nawab or the naib Nazim and the naib uh, Dewan. You remember that in the Mughal system, the administrative powers were divided between the Dewan, who was responsible for civil justice and revenue administration, and the Nazim, who was responsible for Nizamat, which was basically responsible for defense, criminal justice, policing, etc. So by the Treaty of Allahabad with Shah Alam, Diwani was given to the company, the Nizamat was retained with the Nabab. Now this Nizamat right, eventually would be taken away. So and this is a process which is initiated in 1765. Initially, they would actually function through an Indian person or Indian functionary like Muhammad Reza Khan. But from 1770-72 onwards, after particularly this huge extraction by Muhammad Reza Khan to fulfill the company's expectations of high revenue will led to the devastating famine which in Bengali is known as Chiyattar and Mondanto. This is the great famine of 1769-70. The company decides to take over the revenue administration directly, and that was the beginning. But then you come across legislations like Regulating Act in 1772, and a couple of years later, Pitts India Act. The Regulating Act creates a board of control appointed by parliament to keep control or to keep watch over what goes on in Bengal, Pitts India Act further depends the control of the home government, the British government and British parliament on the affairs, companies, rules, compares, activities, companies, um, uh, government in uh, Bengal. Then if the huge resources were uh, used for expanding the army soon, the company's army in Bengal became 40,000 strong. And that was the moment in the early part of the 1770s that a new framework of governance began to emerge, which would make Baksar, the transfer of Diwani, and the chain of events following it, events of far greater moment, events of far greater importance. It created the foundation of a new framework of rule that the company created between 1765 and 1772. So it is not as if the company merely sailed into the Mughal system. The company, while, sailed into, while it sailed into the Mughal system, also began to create a new one by the early 1770s. And the huge army that uh, became possible because of this huge revenue resource that the company now had access to became the sort of further advance 
from Benares westward to Delhi. So that is the significance. Bengal is, this is the reason why Bengal was the British bridgehead. Soon, the company would move westwards to Awadh, to Delhi, ultimately to create their huge empire in India. So, we have been trying to explain to you how a stable government or a stable political system in Bengal, which was there in the mid-18th century, began to go downhill, began to be fractured. What were the major sources of conflict between Siraj and the company? I have listed a few. The issue of private trade, the issue of fortification, the question of the company showing deliberate defiance against the ruler. How some of these issues remain relevant even after Siraj was removed, how Birkasim was actually incensed by the company's abuse of private trade and decided to abolish private the tax altogether and also began to concentrate on North Bengal as a possible way escape from the company's control. How as a consequence of the failure of Mirkashim to successfully translate his dream to resist the company eventually paved the way for Dewani and the consequent reorganization of the apparatus of government in Eastern India.